morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got quite a lot that I need to get through in uh, a very limited and short uh, time frame, so I'll get straight into it. Section 197 of the Labor Relations Act deals with the legal consequences of the transfer of the whole or part of any business, trade, undertaking, or service as a going concern. In essence, if there is a transfer as a going concern, there is an automatic transfer of employees to the new employer. All the rights and obligations between the old employer and its employees become rights and obligations between the new employer. And anything done by the old employer in relation to its employees is deemed in effect to have been done by the new employer in respect of those employees. And there's no interruption in service. In other words, there's a continuity of service. All the years of service are recognized. The clear intention of Section 197 is to protect the jobs and terms and conditions of employment of employees affected by a transfer of a business as a going concern. The question as to what constitutes a transfer as a going concern has been the subject matter of litigation over a number of years. A number of years back, it was clearly recognized that an outsourcing situation clearly fell within the ambit of Section 197. A contentious part of, uh, of, of the topic then became, is second generation uh, outsourcing also a transfer as a going concern? And the courts had, uh, had, had to determine over the next few years what occurred in subsequent transfers following an original transfer uh, of a business in an outsourcing situation. Now I intend to deal today with the recent Constitutional Court judgment delivered late last year, which has far-reaching um, consequences for businesses involved in contracting. I also intend to deal with a Labour Court judgment which was delivered late December last year, following upon the Constitutional Court judgment. <coughs> of importance to everyone concerned dealt with the situation where there was a change in con uh, on the award of contracts but where there had not been an outsourcing in the first uh, place. I'll then consider very briefly the implications of these developments in the law relating to Section 197 and um, the implications on the contracting industry. Uh, the recent constitutional court judgment dealt with a situation in which South African Airways terminated an agreement with a service provider, LGM. The services had originally been outsourced from SAA to LGM. On termination of the agreement with LGM, the services were to be provided to SAA by a new contractor. LGM then indicated to the trade unions that it intended to trench in its employees who had become rendered redundant by reason of the loss of the contract. The unions approached the Labour Court for declaratory relief um, to declare that the termination of that contract and the awarding of a new contract to another service provider fell within the ambit of Section 197. Clearly, if Section 197 uh, applied, then the employees would continue the employment on the same terms and conditions but with the new service provider. If it did not apply, then it would be retrenched. The Labour Court held that Section 197 did not apply, and its reasoning was based on the wording of uh, the relevant section, which says that, and it found that a transfer by, that's the word used, the old employer, was in fact um, problematic because the transfer was from LGM to the new contractor that did not involve a transfer by the old employer, which was deemed in, those, in the case to be SAA. The Labour Appeal Court came to the opposite conclusion and found that Section 197 applied. The case then reached the Supreme Court of Appeal, which, uh, which in turn found that Section 197 did not apply. The case then reached the uh, Constitutional Court and in November last year, in a split decision of six to five of the 11 Constitutional Court judges, the majority found that, well, well in fact the majority and the minority judgments agreed on this point, they found that the purpose of Section 197 was to change the common law situation in line with the constitutional right to fair labour practices, is also to safeguard workers' security 
and to facilitate a smooth transfer of a business by guaranteeing the new employer um, labor to perform the services. Both majority and minority judgments decided that the use of the words in the Act uh, transfer by one employer to another employer did not exclude the application of Section 197. Now, the Constitutional Court then went on to exclude the, uh, the concept that outsourcing should be dealt with differently from any other transaction which involved a transfer of a business. And what it said was, it does not matter in principle what the generation of the outsourcing is, and this is the important part for, for concern to yourselves, or even whether the transaction is concerned with contracting out at all. The true inquiry is whether there has been a transfer of a business as a going concern by the old employer to the new employer. Constitutional Court confirmed that the inquiry as to whether there has been a transfer of a business as a going concern by the old employer to the new employer is a matter of fact to be determined objectively, and that inquiry involves a determination as to whether there's a transfer, whether there's a transfer of a business, and whether it's, that business has been transferred as a going concern. Now, in this regard, the Constitutional Court endorsed its earlier approach in the um, the Haru judgment which dealt with an outsourcing uh, arrangement. Now, in the majority judgment, the, there's an interesting passage which seems to deviate from the logic that um, if there was uh, no outsourcing to start with, uh, it would not form part of a, a transfer as a going concern. Now, I'll just read to you a very brief extract from the judgment uh, where this passage appears. <coughs> And in the majority uh, judgment, it said the following. If the outsourcing institution from the outset did not offer the service, that service cannot be said to be part of the business of the transferor. What happens is simple contracting out of the service, nothing more, nothing less. There is no transfer of the business as a going concern. The outsourcee is contracted to provide the service, and it becomes obliged to do so. And it is the outsourcee's responsibility to make appropriate business infrastructure arrangements. Cancellation of the contract in these circumstances entails only that the outsourcee forfeits the contractual right to provide the service. Now, following this judgment, the Labour Court in uh, late December last year had to deal with an urgent application dealing with the termination of a contract by Arsenal Mittal um, and the award of the contract to another service provider. Now, the facts of that case are very briefly as follows. The outgoing service provider, Hasco, provided services to Arsenal Mittal relating to the management and processing of slag, which is a byproduct of smelting of uh, iron ore. For these purposes, Hasco operated a number of uh, metal recovery plants and crushing and screening plants for various Arsenal Mittal sites. And these services have been provided for some 40 odd years. Arsenal Mittal initiated a tender process, and Hasco, the old service provider, was unsuccessful in its tender bid, and the contracts were awarded to a new service contractor. As part of the tender transactions, Arsenal Mittal was required to repurchase from uh, Hasco certain planting equipment and the new service provider was in turn contractually required to acquire certain of that planting equipment but not all of it, in fact the majority was not acquired and the new service provider was in fact contributing approximately 500 million rand in um, new capital expenditure. New contractor, however, offered employment to the majority of the outgoing contractor's employees. None of the parties appear to have contemplated that the transaction would fall within Section 197. However, when the Constitutional Court judgment came out, Hasco, the outgoing contractor, uh, brought an urgent application to declare that the termination of its contracts and the award of the new contracts to the new service providers uh, was covered by Section 197. The Labour Court considered the fact that all the, the assets were not taken over was important in regard to whether or not it could find that there was a transfer of a business as a going concern. It however found that that was not determinative of the issue. 
The court decided on the facts before it where the majority of employees are taken over and some assets are taken over. That transaction fell within section 197 and the new service contractor found that it actually now employed uh, all the employees involved in that uh, business of the old service provider. The Labour Court considered what would have avoided this transaction falling within the scope of Section 197, and it said the following. It remained open to Phoenix and Tube City, which were the new um, the contractors which had been awarded the uh, tender. Uh, it remained open to them to employ none of Hasco's employees and to decline to take transfer of any of Hasco's assets. In this event, my conclusion would have been different and there would be no more than a termination of one contract from the beginning of another. But that is not what happened, said the judge. I'd now like to very briefly turn to how we deal with these developments and what their implications are in regard to uh, Section 197 and the contracting environment. So it's clear to us that in the light of this case law, the factual circumstances pertaining to each particular transaction are determinative of whether there is to be a Section 197 transfer and need to be very carefully considered um, by the parties contemplating such transactions. It's clear from the judgments that if there's no transfer of employees and no transfer of assets, well, Section 197 will not apply at all. What is not clear, however, is where the courts will draw the line which will trigger the application of Section 197 if there is a transfer of some employees and a transfer of some equipment. Take, for example, if, if 10 or 20 percent of a workforce were taken over by the new contractor and some, but not the bulk of the um, assets were required uh, for the performance of the contract. Will that trigger Section 197? It's not clear. The courts will have to determine that uh, going forward. And so that creates, unfortunately, uncertainty for contractors um, <coughs> involved in this business because they're not, it's easy to look at the, where you take over all assets of all contracts or you take over none. But somewhere in, the, in between, the courts will determine the line. And at the moment, it still remains uncertain where that line is going to be drawn. Now, in the transport industry, there are bus operators involved in commercial, uh, in private commercial transactions. There are also bus operators involved in transactions covered by the National um, uh, Transport Act. It's clear from the Hosco judgment that it's, it's deal with a private commercial transaction, which was the case in the Arsenal Little Hosco matter. It's clear from those, from that case, that if a in a private commercial contract, the majority of employees and uh, assets are taken over. That transaction will be um, uh, deemed to be a Section 197 uh, transaction. Now, if we take the various contracts which are in terms of the, the Act, we've got your negotiated contracts, your tenured contracts, your subsidised service contracts, Potentially, depending on what the facts, all of those two could fall within the scope of Section 197. And again, the, the message coming out of this is that circumstances need to be very, very carefully considered. Section 197 could also impact on um, subcontracting arrangements and tender process could also give rise to a transaction which could fall within the scope of Section 197. Now, thus, operator will need to be very careful in considering whether or not to submit a tender um, where the tender requirements oblige a successful bidder to take over some of the employees or assets of the outgoing contractor and uh, some of the uh, some, uh, and employees as well. As that could very well bring the tender award within the scope of Section 197. Mm -hmm. Professor Walters this morning questioned why um, the department has in draft contracts inserted a requirement or a right that it could take over terminals from uh, bus operators. I can't speak for the department, but if the 
if, if the contractor requires um, the taking over or use of certain assets, that could be a contributing factor to bringing that particular transaction within the scope of Section 197, particularly if there's another requirement to take over employees. Uh, but I'm sure the department will explain its motivations there. Uh, whilst no one would dispute that employees should be protected in a transfer of business, there are, however, potential negative aspects of Section 197 which can be considered. If, if for example, the service provider had a problematic workforce, I, I don't know the facts, but there was in the newspaper some years back the issue about the, um, the, the service providers at OR Tembo where baggage handling was problematic with a problematic workforce. If Section 197 were to apply to that transaction, the problem would not go away, so the contractor would simply be taking over that problematic workforce. There are also financial implications which could be very uh, problematic. If, for example, a um, bus operator submits a tender based on the assumption that the cost of labour will be at the rate of the SOFAC main agreement and finds that it's, it's now, because the, 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 transit, the awarding of the contract to that bus operator is deemed to be a Section 197 transaction, that, that bus operator could find that it now has a workforce which is employed um, at a higher uh, salary rate because the outgoing operator paid above the soft uh, minimum levels. That could have potentially far-reaching consequences. Uh, and I'd like to question whether or not that that will actually encourage small bus operators in the development of small businesses because that could be uh, something which is too onerous and uh, put a small operator into a situation where the business is no longer viable <coughs> and forced into um, giving up the service the new contract which they've been awarded. Now, the, it, it should be, mind, be borne in mind that if Section 197 applies, um, the, the consequences of taking over of all the employees. So with that, um, with that concept and with that view, a bus operator needs to actually look at the situation and consider the very um, important consequences which can flow to it. Before closing, I'd just like to identify that there are other potential problems which will need to be explored and fleshed out, and that is if we take a situation where a contract is awarded to, it, where it is split up, and then uh, split up between taxis and buses, um, and the, the services provided by the outgoing contractor now form part of an integrated service, that, that could create some difficult and interesting issues when Section 197 applies, if it does apply to that transaction. And of course, uh, Professor Walters this morning also spoke of the problem of uh, if a contractor finds it has excess employees, which would occur if, um, if it found that it had taken over the outgoing contractor's employees, that would, in all probability, result in a retrenchment situation. So I leave you with those uh, issues from a legal perspective, and I'll hear what my co-speakers, co-panelists have to say. Thank you.